Good morning. Today's scripture comes from Luke. Jesus cleanses ten lepers. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? God, your words, my mouth, and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. Our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think it's good in church to confess. Something you may not know about me, but I must confess. Is that before I was a pastor, before I went to grad school, and even before I finished college, I had another job. I was a telemarketer. I sold windshields over the phone. <laughs> yes, it's true. But I do have to brag just a little in telling you this. I was an amazing telemarketer. Uh -huh. I made 100 calls an hour, and I sold like seven windshields an hour. I was top seller of the month three months in a row. Mm -hmm. I was that person who called you and then called you and called you again. But there was a trick that made me the top seller again and again. And I go back to this every time someone asks me, How do you become an excellent telemarketer? And this is what I will tell you. I used a fake name. No, it's true. It's true because, first of all, I used a name that I thought would make people think generously, think graciously about me. I call myself Grace. Hi, this is Grace from American Auto Class. Do you have a cry for a chip in your windshield? See, there are two good things about this. Number one, they hear the word Grace and people respond a little warmer. But two, if they don't, you know who you are, one of those people who gets mad at the telemarketer, starts yelling at them. I could just disassociate. I don't know who they were yelling at, but it wasn't Sarah to be okay. It was so girl named Grace. Telemarketing or selling things, it turns out, runs a little bit in our family, and perhaps some of you were hit up by this cousin out right here. He was uh, selling popcorn the last few weeks. I know. Shouldn't sell things in church. I know. What pressure. There was my kid selling you popcorn. It runs in the family. Well, he was motivated to sell popcorn. First of all, he wanted to fund his first year of scouting to do all the fun things he had ahead. But second, they had these tiered prizes, and he really had his eyes on this little remote control tarantula. I am happy to say he's getting the tarantula. But he sold this popcorn, and then came the moment where I said, You 
have to write thank you notes. Well, he is in first grade, and so he's just working on his penmanship. And he had to write 32 of these notes. Halfway through, he shook his hand and he said, Mom, this is too much. It hurts. Two thirds of the way through, he said, I think it's fine. I've written enough. But we kept going. 32 times. It was like one of those punishments that you saw in the old days of writing something again and again and again. When he wrote 32, Thank you, notes. He was frustrated. But late that night, after he finished number 32, we were going to bed and he said, you know, Mama, I was thinking about those thank you notes and what it all meant. He said, I can help lots of people, don't I? And I said, yeah, you've got lots of people. There are people who are thinking about more than popcorn and remote control tarantulas in Florida, as you know. Hurricane Ian, they're saying, is one of the worst storms that there's been in the United States. And they have bigger concerns than popcorn or tarantulas or thank you notes. I was reading a story about the people who've been affected. And there was one woman who really stood out to me. Her name was Susan, and she was in a town that was supposed to evacuate, and she was preparing to do this, but the person who was supposed to pick her up and take her out of her mobile home had COVID, and Susan was 81 years old, and she made a decision that COVID might be riskier for her than staying in her mobile home, and so she hid in her closet as the storm came. She told this story to a reporter that as she was hiding there, she made peace with the fact that maybe she wasn't going to survive. She was hearing the aluminum pull off of the roof of her mobile home, sheet by sheet by sheet, and it was loud. With each piece, she was remembering her mortality, making peace with what might happen. But Susan survived, and she was the only one in her town that stayed. And when they asked her, how are you now, she told this story about hiding in the closet and what she heard. And then she said, so today, I'm grateful that the sun is shining. And today, I'm grateful for those birds that are singing because they survived too. There are so many stories about this of people who survived, of people who are rebuilding after the storm. And there also is that spirit of gratitude among them. Even in the face of destruction, even in a moment where they've lost the roofs off of their homes, sheet by sheet by sheet, still, there's gratitude in this season of rebuilding, in this season of survival. And our scripture today is about gratitude. It's about survival. It's about Jesus walking in this borderland. If you heard the story from the Gospel of Luke, you know we've been in Luke for a while. We're in the middle to late part of Luke, and we know that Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem to die. And the intensity of his teaching and his healing and everything he's doing is increasing because he's well aware of what's coming. So some of his best and most poignant ministry is happening in these chapters that we're reading. We're reading this story today from Luke where he's encountering ten lepers. And it says that he's in a borderland between Galilee 
and Samaria, a liminal place, not here, not there, but walking along a border. When you walk along a border between here and there, you meet people who are different than you, you encounter people that perhaps are sworn enemies to you. You encounter people like ten lepers who are considered absolutely untouchable. These are people that you don't want to be seen, talking to, speaking to, touching, engaging, certainly not healing. And he encounters these ten lepers and they cry out to him. They call him master. That word master isn't used in any of the other gospels. And throughout Luke, the only other place that's used is when the disciples are speaking to Jesus himself. So this particular word, this recognition that these ten lepers have for Jesus, minister, they acknowledge who he is, they see him. And they cry out and they beg to be healed. And Jesus heals them every single one. He gives them instructions. He says, go from here to the priests and show yourself. This is a big move. We don't want to miss what he's telling them to do. There in that border space between Galilee and Samaria, there where he healed and touched the untouchables, he's sending them back into community. There they were without relationships, without priests, without being allowed into the spaces where priests were, and he's sending them back to reunite with their community. And then there's one. There's one who disobeys Jesus. And it's stressful to me that we're focusing on the one who disobeys as a rule follower myself. It's hard when Jesus lifts up those who don't want to be lifted up. The ones who do things differently or don't always follow the rules, especially a Samaritan, someone who would have been a sworn enemy to a Jewish rabbi, someone who definitely is not the kind of person you want to be seen with, and yet he's the one lifted up, this one Samaritan lover who turns around and thanks Jesus. And Jesus says, with this act, you have been made well. <coughs> this act of saying thank you, of showing gratitude, you have been made well. Thank you. 
When we think about what work God is doing, why does God heal people, why does God bless people, why are we here, what does God want from us? We look to stories like this and all the stories that we've been studying through all of the parables and we see the common thread. Jesus is trying to remind us we belong to one another. That we are all in this together. That it is in the exchange of gratitude and grace. It is in the building of community, the reuniting of those who are on different sides, or those who are separated by borders, or those who believe differently and live differently. It's in bringing them back together that God's transformation emerges. This is truly It's so that all of us can live our holy lives and read our holy scriptures and come to church and then lay at night as we're going off to sleep and singing our prayers. The part of our prayer is, oh God, you've got lots of people. Amen.